Unfortunately, the number one reason why people go to their portal is to go cancel. What we're trying to do on the customer portal is like, how do we convince people the product's not the issue, yeah, right? It's too. the fact that you just have too much. Yeah. Having an option for people when they say they have too much product yep. to edit their frequency, yep. right? I think what a lot of people in the industry do right now is skip, delay, which just kind of pushes the issue off that's till the later. Yeah. For, it, for that's everybody. the default yeah. for everybody. At the end of the day, the core issue is that they just get the product too often for right. how often they use it. Welcome back to another episode of Tomorrow Brand, powered by Recharge. Today, we have the co-founder and CEO of CarPay, Casper, and as well as we have Daniel, who is the director of e-commerce, joining us and coming in and talking about what it's taken them to build the brand to where it is today, but also with a heavy focus on subscription and some of the cool tactics they're doing to build their business. So first of all, for the few people who maybe don't know about you guys or don't know about your brand, why don't each of you take a minute to just give a little bit of an introduction of your backgrounds? Yeah, so uh, my co-founder David and I started Carpe when we were freshmen in college because we both had sweaty hands and wanted to do something to stop our sweaty hands. And it's grown into the number one dermatologist recommended wow. sweat brand for all over the body. So our big focus is sweat and sweat all over the body. And that's basically what we do for anybody who's bothered, not just by odor, but by their actual sweat, whether it's you know sweaty pit stains or sweaty nervous hands or even a sweaty face, we try to make the best solutions out there possible for them. So uh, there's a really natural tie into subscription here because when you're using something like an antiperspirant, that's not something you're gonna use for a month and that stop. Right. That's something that you're gonna be using every month. And so that's a recurring product. And especially because we're not in retail yet, it's kind of a lot to ask of people to log in every single month, purchase another stick, when instead they can just be getting those automatically delivered to their door. So I think subscription's always been a very natural complement to our business, the most natural way for this company to work as an e-commerce business. And it's taken us a very long time to really figure out how to make subscription work. So I'm excited to talk about that today and thank you for having us on the show. Well, no, thank you. And Daniel, a little bit of your background too. Yeah, I met David and Casper about four years ago. Um, I joined as, as just a little web developer on the <laughs> website and you know, I've really taken a liking to CRO and, and growing the website as, as big as I can. And about a year ago, we really started to push into, into subscriptions and so, yeah, I've really just kind of taken that over over the last year and it's scaled to the moon. So. That's amazing. Um, well, I, I, I'd love to understand, you know, before we get into like the nitty gritty of, of what you guys have done to build the brand to where it is today, tell us a little bit about your category too, right? You have, you know, you mentioned it is something that ties in really well with being a retention focused yeah. and subscription focused product. Um, but is that what you guys thought of when you started the business? Like, hey, this is, this is a smart product to come out with because people are going to always need it? Or is it more of like, we're just trying to solve this problem and it just turned into that. So give us a little bit of that background. Yeah, it was going to be just a single product, just a fun project kind of in college. When David and I met, I was, I had this mindset of working with various people on various projects, yep. freshman year of college. Uh, with the idea that I, I was studying physics and computer science at Duke and I wanted to learn entrepreneurship kind of by doing. And I was doing that through working with various people on various projects. And a lot of them were a lot more technically focused than when I met David and he says, hey, we both have sweaty hands. I've been toying with the idea of making a hand antiperspirant. I thought that was at the time the least exciting thing in the world. Right. <laughs> but he was very passionate about it. And I'm like, all right, well, it is a problem for me. But I figured that if this was a big problem for a lot of people, we'd have seen a lot more validation by now. And he said, look, I've talked to dermatologists, I've, I've visited them, and they said that there is no first line solution for excessive sweat. I mean, people are going to dermatologists and you need to get prescription treatments for anticholinergics, Botox, and they just want something simple for people's sweaty hands. Um, and I said, okay, well, if, it's, if the demand is there, why isn't this already in Walgreens? Why isn't this online? And we looked online and there were a lot of hand antiperspirants out there. They just all had an average rating of about one star. And so again, that was, I think, the extent of the market validation. And we figured there's clearly a need here, but it's probably not a massive need. This probably isn't like going to be a global brand. We just want to make an effective solution for sweaty hands. And when we bought these products online, we realized that they were all very greasy. People were just taking an antiperspirant active ingredient and putting it in a lotion, which makes your hands feel sweatier. So for the next year, our goal became to develop just this inactive base for the active ingredient that you know went on smooth, that didn't leave residue, but that dried quick, that mm. made your hands feel less sweaty um, rather than more greasy. And so when we succeeded at that, 
we started selling our product on Amazon and on our website in 2015. And the reviews came in very, very well. I mean, it, it grew up organic acquisition for the first year or so. And we, uh, we thought, honestly, at the time that this is probably going to be it. We're just going to have a nice, small hand antiperspirant out there. But dermatologists actually started coming to us because we were pretty involved in the dermatologist community in North Carolina. That's how we were getting a lot of feedback about the products and understanding how people were actually using them. I mean, we wanted to work with the people who, you know, work with people with excessive sweating every single day. It's not that our focus was clinically excessive sweating, but it's sort of like if you're making a solution for a problem that people at the extreme will see dermatologists for, you want to be working with dermatologists. And what we started hearing from these dermatologists is that they were recommending this product for people to use on their underarms. And we said, that's insane. There's so many underarm antiperspirants. And the dermatologists were saying, yeah, but I haven't seen any that work as well as yours. Wow. And that, that was the beginning of us starting to get into underarm antiperspirant development because we thought that was kind of a solved problem. We thought underarm antiperspirants were going to be as good as they get. But it turns out that through our focus on making on the inactive ingredients, really, on like the drying and sweat wicking and sweat absorbing ingredients in the rest of the formula, we created something that could outperform for a lot of people what they were currently using for their underarms. And so that became one of the biggest categories of our business. And through that time, we also continued to move into sweat all over the body because, you know, sweating doesn't just happen on the hands. It doesn't just happen on the underarms. It happens on the feet, face, right. breast, thighs, everywhere. So we have sweat solutions for the entire body. But I do think that the way a lot of people are discovering us right now is as an alternative to what they're currently using for their underarms because they're either not happy with the sweat control that they're getting for their underarms or they're using something that doesn't stop sweat at all. They're using a deodorant that doesn't have any antiperspirant properties. Mm. And so that has been, I think, why Carpe's really grown a lot over the last few years is because we're just providing a solution to a problem that a lot of people have and that they haven't found an adequate solution for. It's incredible. Um, you know, a lot of our theme of the Tomorrow Brand podcast is about not just creating products and, and thinking of, you know, what problems to solve, but also how you're going to think about evolving into tomorrow and how do you stay uh, uh, and, and become a brand that isn't just thought about as a solution for today, but also for tomorrow. And so I think a lot of how you guys have built has been incredible. Uh, one little fun fact we like to do for all brands um, as a little icebreaker before we get into, again, like the tactics we said is uh, give us give us the story of the name. What, what, how did how did Carpe get? I wish, we had a, I wish we had a great story here. All right, so the original name was Clutch. Our legal name is still Clutch Inc. because we incorporated <laughs> as Clutch because we thought it was the best pun. It's like, oh, it's coming in Clutch. You know, you're clutching somebody's uh, hand cool. with your dry, yeah. confident handshake. And when we started working with our first real advisors, these three guys in downtown Durham who had previously sold uh, Thundershirt, which is this like dog anxiety wrap that a few people may have heard of. And they said, have you done a trademark search? And I said, yeah, I Googled it. There's no other Carpe antiperspirants. And they said, no, have you done like a proper trademark search? And that's when I learned about trademarks and international classes. And in our international class three, uh, or sorry, I Googled it. There was no clutch antiperspirant at the time. Yeah. Um, in our international class three, that's any personal care products, which includes cologne. And Abercrombie and Fitch had a clutch cologne trademark, oh. which was not doing very well <laughs> online. You know, the reviews were not very good. And I said, look, guys, they don't care. It's not a it's not a hero product for them. They won't mind if we do this. And Bootstrap basically said, this is uh, that's a very bad attitude, guys. Like you could just avoid a lot of headaches down the road if you just change the name right now. Yeah. We were extremely reluctant to change the name because this had been a project for us for about a year at that point. And, and we'd gotten very to, attached to, yeah, yeah, to what we call it, which was Clutch. And I remember David was saying, look, we've got 100 followers on the Facebook page. Like that's a lot of brand recognition. We're going to lose a lot of brand recognition if we move the name. And they're saying, you haven't even launched the product yet. You have no brand recognition, which was absolutely correct. David and I did some soul searching. We decided, all right, we can do this. We can change the name. And we brainstormed a ton of different names. And, uh, you know, when we initially started the brainstorm, it was just guys in the room. And we were saying, all right, we're going to call it like Alpha or Peak. Somebody proposed money. Uh, so <laughs> so names that would have absolutely doomed our company from the start. <laughs> and then we started talking to like, you know, a more diverse cast of friends, including women who are like, what? Why would you call a product Alpha? <laughs> yeah. like, oh, it just feels cool, right? Um, and we ended up with Carpe, which captured that same energy. This was actually proposed by a British friend of ours, incredibly creative guy, who had initially come up with the clutch idea because he thought it was a great pun. And now he said, oh, if you can't do clutch, do like carpe, like carpe diem. 
still that same seized, yeah. confident energy. And everybody liked it. And uh, I think we stumbled into a really good name, except for uh, the people who call it carp or carpet <laughs> or you'd think people know how to pronounce carpet. You'd think carpe diem is I a common phrase. I feel like people are looking for like a little apostrophe on the, for the e, apostrophe, yeah. and yeah. it's not supposed to be there. <laughs> no, but then if we did the apostrophe, imagine how awful that would be online. Yeah. Like, yeah. Do we type it into every yeah. on the website? Do we yeah. type the apostrophe? Oh, do we God. lose it? Only have yeah. it in the logo. So, yeah. well, um, that, I, th I think that's a really cool story. Thank <laughs> that's, you. A, that's awesome. That is awesome. Well, let's get into some of the the, the nitty gritty now. You know, before you get into getting people um, to, to subscribe and stay on and build LTV and really build good product and, and recognition, you, you actually have to get the person first, right? Yeah. Um, so talk to us a little bit about the evolution of the acquisition strategy. It doesn't look like you guys started off heavily into um, subscription right away. Um, and it looks like more, um, as Daniel, you mentioned, more in the last year. What were the initial years like? Um, and then what was the shift into um, subscription focus uh, can give us a little bit about the acquisition strategy in both cases. Yeah. E-commerce is a very dynamic marketplace right now. So I think um, best practices change every two years, probably twice a year in some cases. At the time when we launched, I am very confident that launching a business on Amazon and our website at the same time was the right thing to do. I've since seen a lot of companies just focus on Amazon. It's a really good tactic or just focus on their website and it's a really good tactic. But for us, Launching on those two channels was really good because we were able to capitalize on organic acquisition the most. I mean, that's what Amazon continues to be great at, I think, is it is the channel for organic acquisition, whereas Google and you know selling product on your website, in my experience, isn't as great. But because of these varying trends, how we acquire has changed every year, honestly, as the company's grown. And while most companies were growing on Facebook and Instagram from the time we launched, 2015, we didn't crack that channel for a very long time. Mm. And I, I sort of regret that. I think that if we'd been smarter, I think it was a skill issue, we could have been a lot better at online advertising, but we actually did a lot of TV advertising pre-COVID and then oh, wow. post-COVID is when we really shifted online. And I think that no matter where we're advertising, what year it is, the, the marketplace is gonna change, the dynamics are gonna change. If a new channel pops up and it's underpriced, everybody's gonna flock there. That's so right. I think you need to be asking yourself at the end of the day, what are we here to do? We're here to create a problem, a solution to a problem that people have to inform people that we have the solution, right? So right. people who can benefit from the product, we wanna let them know about the product. And the way you do that is just think about where are these people and how can we reach them where they are? So sure. that means both physically where people are spending time, which is on social media a lot right now. That's mm -hmm. why I think, you know, TikTok and meta advertising continues to be the biggest engine of acquisition for a lot of online brands. And also a bit more conceptually meeting them where they are regarding their problems. So when it comes to how we talk about our products, how we, mm -hmm. the, the kinds of creatives that we create, we're thinking about what is, you know, what will connect with people on a problem solution level? What What is, what are the moments that'll make somebody stop and say, hey, that's actually something that I've been struggling with and it seems like this could be a good solution. I'm ready to give it a try. Makes sense. Um, so you, you, you touched on how meta, TikTok and social media has played. Um, and, and I agree, you know, even for Obvi, we've 98% of our spend is between Google, Meta, and TikTok. Um, I'm, I'm curious, when, it, when you're looking at your acquisition strategy versus when I look at mine, which is not a subscription company, Yeah. Um, I'm looking at like, hey, I, I just want that AOV. I just want that AOV, 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 right? Um, okay. So, and I'm curious, like, is it like, what cost are we, are we getting the subscriber for? Um, and is it, is it like, hey, we, we, we need to focus that, that they have to subscribe? Or is it like, if they subscribe, now we'll like focus on, you know, maintaining and, and growing that and, and, and building the, the, the back end of it. I'm curious just how is that mental model work when you guys are going to market on different platforms? I think the implications for customer economics are not that complicated as you suggested. If you don't have a lot of subscription or if you don't even have a lot of recurring purchase potentially, you wanna be focused on AOV and making sure that you know, you're know you not losing a ton of money on the, you're, you're not really losing any money on the first purchase right. ideally. Right. I think uh, you don't wanna be overly optimistic with a subscription model and say, hey, I'm definitely gonna retain so I can afford to lose a lot of money on the, the first acquisition. But I think all, all of these paradigms are really downstream of what is the correct model for my product and my customer. And I think for us, we recognized 
it took us too long to recognize because I do think we were potentially thinking about it a lot in the kind of micro of, okay, you know, this is generally how much we're spending on marketing mm -hmm. to get a customer. And this is how much they're going to spend on the website. And so this is how much we can afford. And we were really thinking about that game instead of taking a step back and realizing like, okay, are people buying the product in the way that's ideal for them? Because I, I do yeah. think the ideal way for people to buy antiperspirants is retail. I mean, people say this time and again, 85%, 90% of people want to buy these products in retail because there they can take the caps off and smell them. So we're fighting an uphill battle online. But if you're not buying them in retail, it becomes pretty intuitive that you do want something that will come to you every month because you're going to be using up these products. So Great I think we, we realized, okay, subscription is the correct model for this kind of product. And if we just put subscription on the website, which to Daniel's point, it's been the past year that subscriptions really started working, but we've been trying to put subscription on the website for the past five years. And initially, customers just weren't interested. And it's, and it's been five years of honestly trying to figure out how do we position it hmm. to really make people want to subscribe and recognize that this is the way that will lead to the best experience with the product. Because you can't just force it on people. If you force yeah. it on people, they'll get upset, they'll cancel immediately, they might not even convert. Uh, so it's it's a kind of, it's a long-term series of tests that led us to, here's how we present subscription, here's how we encourage people to subscribe and have the best results with the product. And really highlighting in many cases that the people who do have the best results with the product tend to be the people who subscribe yep. um, because they get into consistent usage, they get into better results. I am curious though, why aren't y'all subscription-based? Because it is a product with you know, consumption that, uh, what, what's the word? It's a consumable, right? It so, is consumable. Yeah. Um, so so it's interesting, um, and it's a good question. The, the way you look at like the health and wellness category, right, especially for us, which is in like beauty and weight loss, right? Those are two ma major categories. You take the demographic where we target 50 year old women in the Midwest mm. um, that don't have good habits, okay? And so we're trying to shape them to have better habits around health, wellness, beauty, um, and weight loss. Now, when you pair this category plus the demo we're going after, I'd rather not take the bet on somebody consistently taking my product Interesting. and then finishing it and now a new product has arrived to their door. Yes. Right? And now they're ready to get that into there rather than me saying, hey, we're actually, we kind of just pushed the subscription up front by saying, you need to have three to six months of this. Otherwise, you're not going to see the results you need to. Interesting. So we have we have 136 as our landing page offer. Mm -hmm. Most of our, like 87% of our orders are between three and six. Nobody okay. buys one. So we've I think we've trained that mindset, but I just don't want to rely on this demo to consistently finish my product. Yes. I, want, I want the shelf that they have or the cabinet they have to deal with it. I don't want to be the one to deal with, oh, I still have too much. I want to push my order off. That makes a lot of sense. So I think we're kind of skipping ahead in what we were going to talk about here, but you just hit on the biggest challenge, the core challenge with retention and subscription. And I think it's it's simply what you said. It's, it's product building up too much. Because yeah. I think for your product and definitely for ours, the usage rate varies dramatically. Yeah. If you have a supplement where you know, you're taking one pill every day, most people are going to finish a bottle of 30 pills in 30 days. Yep. With an antiperspirant, even if we had, I think, a pretty precise dispensing amount, people's armpits have massively different sizes. People have different preferences on how much they want to apply, what you yep. know, feels right to them. And so we've got people who will finish a stick uh, in two weeks, and we've got people who will finish a stick in three months. Yep. And if we give people too many choices about subscription interval at the start, that'll overwhelm them because they're already trying to choose their products, choose their scents. And if we say, okay, on top of that, how frequently do you think you'll need a new one? They'll say, you know what? I don't know. I'm done. This is this is too much too much effort. Uh, you want to make things as simple as possible for people up front. So the model that we found to work for us the best is to start everybody on a one month subscription cycle and then do everything we can to make it as easy as possible for people to adjust their subscription frequency. Because the number one reason people aren't happy with their subscription is that they just have too much product building up, that they're not using it at the, at the speed that they want to. Uh, and so that continues to be, I think, something that we're working on is figuring out yeah. better ways to make yeah. it easier for subscribers to adjust their frequency, to get that frequency that they want. Makes but sense. I agree that it's a huge challenge. It is probably the number one retention challenge is to nail what is that subscription system, that subscription program that will make the customer happy. Yeah, yeah. you've come to that. Yeah, yeah. Un unfortunately, the number one reason why people go to their portal is to go cancel, right? right? And so what we're trying to do on the customer portal is like, how do we convince people that 
the product's not the issue, yeah, right? It's you. the fact that you just have too much. Yeah. Um, and so in the cancellation flow, we've really like, we've been pushing recharge on this as well, yeah. but having an option for people when they say they have too much product yep. to edit their frequency, yep. right? I think what a lot of people in the industry do right now is skip, delay, which yeah. just kind of pushes the issue That's off till later. Yeah, for, it, for That's everybody. the default yeah. for everybody. It is, um, it's what everyone's trained now. Exactly. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the core issue is that they just get the product too often for right. how often they use it, right. right? And so we've, you know, we, we've been working with Recharge a lot recently on, on getting the edit frequency as like a cancellation flow reason. That's smart. Right? Yeah. And so. And Recharge has been great about yeah. improvements to the portal to bring these things to the forefront. I think there's a lot of, um, I, I think there's almost two camps in e-commerce on almost every issue. Um, and both have elements of truth, but I, I think a lot of people come into e-commerce and they're saying, how can we sort of growth hack? What's the yeah. way to improve the CDR? What's the way to reduce churn? And I think the sort of high level, um, taking a step back approach is what are the underlying drivers of that? Right. How can we create an experience that will make customers happy and not want to do that? And I think that long-term, whenever we're focusing on just making a better experience, understanding the customer problem, that leads to the best outcomes, that leads to the best brand, that leads to people who are excited to share yeah. this with their friends and you know stay, stay engaged with the products. Yeah. And I think that skipping is sort of a Prioritizing skipping is sort of a, a growth tactic where yeah. it's like, okay, let's just let's just delay that cancellation versus if you take a step back and you think, why does somebody want to skip? Uh, how can we make the product better for them? Because the product isn't just the physical unit of antiperspirant in our case, it's everything. It's how often we ship it, how it's shipped, how it's packaged, is the email communications, it's their entire experience with our brand, I think is the product. Yeah. And particularly, I think in a subscription especially, you do need to think of your subscription as part of that product. How can we improve the product for them? We can improve the product by changing the interval to match what works for them. I think right. if they're coming to us and they're willing to skip, that doesn't indicate that, uh, that's not like a, a win. I mean, in a growth hacking yeah. sense, that's a win, but I think more so that's a signal to us that the product isn't quite right in the sense that the intervals aren't quite right. right. And if we can fix that for them in an easy way, that's, that's I think, the ideal outcome. Yeah. I love that. Customers who delay or skip their order, half of them don't even get to their next order, which is what we found was like fascinating to that us. Is, it's yeah. like, yeah. this really just kind of pushes that customer down the road. And yes, you still have an active subscription yep. on there. So you're reducing your churn rate. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if they never order again, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Which is right? why Daniel, I mean, you you always have this point about not getting fixated on particular metrics, especially churn rate. Yeah, churn rate, I think is overused a little bit, especially the one where you look at churn rate of your overall subscriber base. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I never look at it. Yeah. Uh, it's really just a factor of how many new customers you're bringing in. Yeah. So, you know, cause you know, your new customers have the highest churn rate of any cohort. And so yeah. if you're bringing in a lot of new customers, your churn rate's going to be very high, right. but it's a good thing, yeah. right? If you're, your, your churn rates 1%, it means you're not growing. Right. So yeah, that's, right. it's super important for us to look at other aspects of the company. That's right? a great perspective yeah. too. So you need the, you need the holistic picture by all the metrics. And I think at the end of the day, you're not, yeah, these, these kind of like little tweaks and growth hacks and psychological hacks might do a little bit on the margin, but people who do not like the product you're offering, whether it's the physical product or the way the subscription works, they will leave. They do not want to stick with that. And people who like it, uh, they will stick with it. And the big opportunity we have is to change it, whether it's improving the product for people who are not getting results from the product or something like that, or improving the subscription from people who don't like the way the subscription is structured to move people from the camp of people who don't want it to people who want it. Yeah. Makes, uh, I mean, you you guys hit incredible points. It's uh, you guys touched a little bit on communication and messaging in a little bit as well, um, and it reminds me of an anecdote. I, I was actually um, I was talking to the founder of Seed. It's a probiotic company. You guys may have heard of it, and it's actually a product I've taken for a few years now. And um, I was talking to him, and uh, they they said there was one thing that they did, um, and I'm curious if you guys have any one big moment too. But they they had one thing that drastically changed consumption okay. and reduced churn. And it was like, oh, no way. There's no way this is it. Um, but it was. What they had was when they launched, they were just called a prebiotic yeah. um, and probiotic um, supplement. They'd always be like, people are taking it. They're taking it sometimes, taking it some days. Some days they won't. A 30-day supply is some lasting 43 and a half days. Like, how do we make it 30 days, right? Because um, they're timing, because uh, they, they, they give you a reuse, uh, re, uh, refillable package that they wanted to time properly. And they did this one test where they changed the product name 
to daily prebiotic. Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I and, know this. Yeah. And uh, he's telling me, and I was like, he was like, that completely changed our consumption to be at the 33 day mark. And I'm like, that's an insane improvement. It's like a 25% yeah. improvement in consumption because somebody just understood that I need to do this daily and they just were told that. Mm -hmm. And so now mm -hmm. you're treating it like a vitamin, yeah. right? Because a daily multivitamin is typically how we're trained to look at our multis. That's know? a great example. Right? Um, so I'm very curious, like yeah. get, touch, talk to me a little bit about messaging. I'm sure you guys have done a plethora of tests, but are there some cool ones or, or any cool um, uh, ones that kind of stick out as, as like tests that you guys did that kind of help change certain parts of um, whether it's consumption or churn or, or any of that um, in your end. I love this seed example. I, I'm familiar with it as the daily prebiotic and yeah. I didn't realize that's where it came from. And yeah. that's crazy that that yeah. was such a big difference for them. I don't know if they've changed their website since I looked at it, but when I last looked at it a couple years ago, it was one of the most beautiful websites it is, I've ever it seen. It is, yeah. it still is. <laughs> it's stunning, it's stunning. So great work to the seed team. Um, very analogously, if you look at the research for antiperspirants, you'll find that applying before bed leads to better results. And in general, using twice a day will lead to better results. And so this is something that we would like sometimes that. say in like post-purchase emails or even in package inserts, nobody reads that. We kind of change our paradigm about what the packaging needs to serve for an e-commerce business. In retail, the packaging needs to sell the product. And I think that's the way that everybody approaches packaging by default. In an e-commerce business, you've got all of this messaging around the packaging in any mm -hmm. context in which the packaging exists. So on Amazon, you've got all the messaging around the package. On your website, you've got all the messaging around. So the packaging doesn't really need to sell the product. But once the product is in somebody's hands, the packaging is the only thing that they've got to go by. And so we started thinking of the packaging as the only place, the, the most prominent place we can communicate a message of usage instructions. And it needs to be something as simple as, it's brilliant to me that you just call it daily prebiotic and yeah. that's the messaging. For us, the similar example is we tested on the packaging saying apply two times daily because at the end of the day, that's what the research was showing was the best results. And I think that was so much of an ask for people that they almost ignored it. Yeah. And we changed it to just say apply before bed which makes a massive difference. That's, I think, 90% of the value that you're um, gonna get versus applying two times daily. Yeah. And we saw that in the data. People were having subjectively better experiences. They were sticking with the product because they were getting better results when they were applying before bed. And that's the most prominent thing you'll see in our packaging right now besides carpe, the scent, and then apply before bed. That is super cool. You guys you guys are so dialed in, I love that. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, I, I wanna touch on one more piece before we uh, move on to a little bit more on customer portal and, and cancellation and whatnot, but taking customers who didn't subscribe, came in as a one-time purchase, and now you're trying to make the, turn them into, hey, you've made a decision, but now let's make a commitment, right? Give me a little bit of that journey. Any cool tactics there? What are you guys doing there to, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of it is email, SMS, messaging oriented, but um, is, there, is there certain things that you guys have done that has um, been super successful in being able to convert one-time purchase to subscriber post-purchase? The first thing that comes to mind for me is that we've always had a much higher subscription percentage on repeat purchase. Yeah. When somebody's coming back to the brand, they've already tried the product and they're much more willing to say, okay, now I'm going to stick with it. And it's still something that I think you have to experiment for your own brand, for your own product, for your own purchase flows. What is going to persuade the customer that, hey, subscribing is worth it for you? Because I mm. think we all crave flexibility and freedom. So if it's just like subscribe you know, for no benefit, you will probably feel like, why am I locking myself into something? Why am I committing to something? Uh, and I, I, again, it's it really varies by product, but we've tested a lot of messages that basically re reassure, hey, we have a portal, you can change frequency at any time, you can cancel at any time, so don't worry, you're not really locking yourself yeah. into anything here. There's a financial benefit to subscribing. You know, We have a discount for subscribers, and at the end of the day, you're going to have better results if this product keeps coming to you and you keep consistently using it. So. I, it's there's not a single specific message or a single specific touch point where I feel like it made a world of difference, but testing those different messages at different times really incrementally started increasing our subscription rate. And I think the way you're thinking about it is absolutely right, looking at it with different cohorts of new customers and returning customers. Hmm. I think the biggest challenge that we have 
in understanding returning customer behavior is that when you're looking at website conversion rates, you can see post-conversion whether somebody who purchases a new customer or a returning customer, but you can't break out the conversion rate of those two cohorts because you don't see who browsing the website is a new customer, returning customer. So I, I wish we had that data. Yeah, that would make yeah. optimizing these things a lot easier. Oh yeah, yeah, that, that would be, um, that, that would feel like godlike. Right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that's really cool. I, I like that. Um, and and um, I, I want to pivot a little bit now into like the, you've, you've now acquired, whether it's customers or new people through your funnel, they're, they've seemingly subscribed. Now it's obviously keeping them subscribed, also making sure that if they're on their way out the door, um, you have as many ways to make sure they don't walk out. Um, so let's pivot into there. Uh, how do you guys tie in um, loyalty, rewards, and some of those elements to make sure that you guys strengthen the need to stay subscribed? And, and maybe, and, and I'm curious on your point, maybe those things aren't really strengthening it it's more so just like nice to haves, but really what strengthens is, is the product and the messaging around it. So I'm curious how, what, what place does rewards, loyalty play into uh, keeping a subscriber happy and um, keeping them subscribed? Yeah. Historically, Recharge hasn't had a way for us to like a loyalty program or give credits to customers. They just released it recently, so yep. I'm super excited. Okay. Our first test we launched is giving customers cash back on their order when they get their first recurring shipment, right? When they get their first. When they Got get it. their first recurring shipment, give them some cash back. Essentially, it's like a discount on your next order. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have data yet, but I, I'm super excited to see that come in over the next like two or three weeks. That's awesome. So. Are you doing that flat line across the board no matter the customer, or is it a certain type of cohort? New customers, 50-50. Cool. See what happens. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't want me to be controversial here, but I'm, we always, you know, internally, we, we kind of take sides on what we yeah. think is going to happen with the test. I don't know, maybe it will have an impact. I think that loyalty programs massively vary based on the brand and the product. And I yeah. think if you have, this is an oversimplification, but perhaps if you have a bit more of a commoditized product, uh, and I'm thinking of air travel is like the most successful example of loyalty programs. I think that works. I think in air travel, it really works because you're sitting down and you're looking at flights at similar times by similar airlines with similar prices. And I, then you're saying, okay, am I going to do Delta or am I going to do American Airlines? And I think you're going to do the one that you, you know, are earning benefits with if sure. you continue to fly with them. Uh, I think that with something like an anti-perspirant, you're using our product because it works for you or you're not using our product because you've got something that you prefer. And I don't think that if somebody's unhappy with our product, they're gonna stick around because they are getting points or something like that. So I think for us, it's coming back to making sure that the product is something that people genuinely want to continue using, both in the physical stick of antiperspirant and the subscription program. So to me, the most important aspect in retention is making sure that we can adapt that subscription, adapt that product to what the person needs. That means making it easy for people to swap sends. That means making it easy for people to change their subscription interval. That is the big thing on retention. And then really getting close to churn, I think that churn save is a similar thing. If, if somebody really intends to leave and you are saying, hey, are you leaving because you know you don't like something about the product that we can change? And they're like, no, I don't care. I don't care if you change the subscription interval. I just want to leave. Then at that point, I don't think uh, you know there's really much you can do to stop them. I okay. think if they're not happy, they're going to leave, and that's fine. What you really, really desperately want to avoid is losing the people who don't want to leave. Yeah. And I think this happens with a certain subset of passive churn where people will either change their address and they won't know how to update it and they'll get fr frustrated and they'll just say, you know, this isn't worth it. I'm just going to cancel it because canceling is sometimes, it's pretty obvious. You're just like cancel, 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 delete, delete, delete. Yep. Changing an address, you might have to go in there, figure out what your subscription is, how it's structured, how you ch change the shipping address and everything. So I think that shows up as active churn, but to me, it's a form of passive churn is losing people because they move. Mm. The most prominent form of passive churn that I think neither the customer wants nor the brand is if somebody's credit card expires or they need to cancel their credit card because there was fraud and they didn't necessarily want to lose the subscription. So they are saying, okay, well, let me update this payment method. Sure. And the friction of updating the payment method is so high that they, uh, that they don't do it and they give up on the subscription. I think that's a tragedy for everybody involved. And this is a difficult technical problem. This isn't something that I think the brands can do because it's dealing with credit card information. So like we could make some kind of 
form that we email to people and makes it super so easy true. for them to update their credit card. We can't do that. That is very not PCIe compliant. Yeah. So we really need to count on the subscription platforms to do that. And that's why we're happy that Recharge has made this such a priority of making it easy for customers to update their payment information. Because I mean, literally just this morning, I was speaking with our customer service team. We, it was a team-wide standup and they were talking about a couple customers who reached out because they just couldn't figure out how to update their payment information. And the specific problem that they described is something that I think Recharge is like rolling out imminently, right? Mm -hmm. and, and this isn't to say that this was a shortcoming in Recharge. This is something that I think I've seen on every subscription platform we've used. Recharge has prioritized making this easy for customers, but it's it's difficult. It's credit card information. So, right. you know, the platform has to figure out how to do it in a compliant way that's still very easy for customers. And that's one thing that I think we've been incredibly happy with Recharge about because our history with subscription is we used to be on when we launched the website, we built our own first e-commerce website on Ruby on Rails because okay. we were dumb and I was a computer science major. And I think also at the time, Shopify, for whatever reason, thought that it was going to be launching, it was going to be the facilitator for marketplace websites. Like the economy was going to be marketplace websites. Right. And pretty quickly it became apparent it's going to be the marketplaces or, you know, uh, Amazon, Walmart, and then it's brand websites that sometimes right. have one product, two products, sometimes they have a wider assortment. But in 2015, I don't think Shopify was good at one product websites. And that's why we, we wrote our own. Uh, for the checkout facilitator, we used something called Foxycart, which is a very lightweight product. I think they're still around. And I think for that use case, they're very good. And they have integrated subscriptions. But again, they don't make things like updating payment information very easy for customers. Sure. And so when we moved to Shopify, Recharge was that big incumbent, was kind of the only option in the room. And so moving to Shopify necessitated moving to Recharge and it was a solid subscription platform, but then Shopify really opened the ecosystem. And I was pretty confident that Recharge was gonna go the way of like the old uh, ERPs or Salesforce or any of these other bloated SaaS companies that are just like, they've been the incumbent, they don't know how to be anything else other than the monopoly. So when the new entrants come in, the new entrants are gonna be much better. And so we were speaking with these new entrants, we actually started a migration to one of these new uh, pop-up subscription providers. <laughs> And we found in that migration that the CEO had basically directly lied to us about a capability, yeah. which he said, these particular tokens, I think the detail was something like Apple Pay. Yeah. Like we weren't able to transfer Apple Pay onto this platform. And they'd said verbatim, like, we can definitely do this. We start the entire migration, which is a very costly yes. and headache of a process. And fortunately, we always kind of made sure that we weren't destroying anything that would prevent us from going back to recharge in a snap. And when we realized like we were going to lose subscribers passively in this migration because they just couldn't oh. migrate these tokens, we said, we can do this, we're going back to recharge. And we were blown away by how, how much recharge seemed to, um, I, I have a disagreement with the folks at Recharge here. I think from my perspective, they really stepped up their game mm. that year. Uh, I think it's an incredible team full of like, when I met the team, I was shocked that this is a company that kind of, it's was able to have a monopoly yeah. for a while because generally you know you know <laughs> these companies that have a monopoly and they're like bloated full of sea levels that yeah, yeah, yeah. you know are in suits and living in penthouses and the the ceo of recharge uh Oshin, Oshin, he's yeah. a great guy really like yeah. personable and, and will talk to you and really drive recharge to become a better and better product so Recharge has been putting in the work to continue to roll out the solutions that really help make subscriptions what customers want them to be, make it a great product for brands like us, and be the market leader in subscriptions. Well said. Yeah. And and I think it's so true. I think the biggest point you made, though, is like we, we're we all used to seeing some of these legacy providers, they call them, as like these big bloated organizations. And then you find out like some of them actually still care even about the newest customer yeah. as much as they care about the oldest customer. Yeah. And that's actually what's going to inspire innovation and preservation. Like that's the two things you need for anything to continue onward. So um, I think extremely well said. And and uh, again, just love how you guys think about each step and, and component of your business. Um, I'm curious on, and I know we're coming to a close, but I'm curious on a couple more things, which is around you know that that cancellation piece, right? And and like and I I know it's like you guys talked a lot about it today too. But I still feel that a lot of people think that as soon as somebody approaches that cancellation mindset, that they've lost that person, right? Um, I'm curious, like, do you have like multiple tiers of strategies? And you don't have to tell me the strategies, but do you have multiple tiers of strategy of like, if you choose this, then you go to this quadrant. If you, but if you're in this quadrant, you choose this, you go to this quadrant. Like, is it extremely sophisticated as soon as somebody enters in that area, arena? Or do you guys also have some pulse of saying, you know what, like, if it's because of this reason, this person's probably gonna walk out and it is, it is yeah. part of the game. Yeah. I'll let you speak to the technical details, 
But it's exactly as you laid out and kind of tying back to earlier our discussion of the paradigm of, look, you're not going to get somebody to stick with a product, the subscription being part of the product that they don't like. So if they're coming to you and they say, I want to cancel, I think we do want to know why do you want to cancel and is it something that we can fix for you right now? And if the answer is no, then yeah. all right, have a great day. Sorry that it didn't work out and like hopefully we can do better in the future. But in many cases, we can do it. Like maybe it's it's getting... Uh, financially unsustainable for them. Maybe we can figure out a different price. Maybe the frequency is bad. We can mm. figure out a better frequency solution. And I think Recharge enables this conversation through their cancellation Absolutely. flows. Yeah. So you want to? Yeah. I think the number one thing you can do is go to your customer tickets and read through 500 of them, right? That's where, where I had the biggest unlock on this cancellation flow was okay. going in, reading customer tickets and seeing why people wanted to cancel. It was mind blowing. Like it was not about the product. It was not about, you know, I didn't know it was the subscription. It was literally just that they had too much. And the way that we solve that in the cancellation flow is like we totally unlocked a lot of things in terms of like what responses we default to, what those responses lead to in the cancellation flow. Mm -hmm. um, we've un unlocked a lot there. But ultimately, like if they're going to cancel, they're going to cancel. We're not going to make it 15 steps yeah. to make it a hassle, okay. right? Like it's two steps. Right. You answer a question. Right. You know, we might give you a discount and then you you, you it. cancel it, okay. right? Like there's yeah. not really much we can do. We can make it 15 steps. The same amount of people are going to cancel, yeah. right? So it's really just about reading those customer tickets, understanding why they're canceling and trying to solve that up front. Exactly. The portal. So, so to the point of multiple layers, I mean, we can solve that in customer portal. And some of those yeah. insights that we learn, we can try to solve ahead of them even having the thought to cancel. We can prevent, you know, yeah. them ever having the intent of going to the customer portal to cancel. Incredible. Great insights. Um, so two last things, um, but uh, one last icebreaker um, to, to wrap up the show. What is, uh, besides Carpe, what's your guys' favorite subscription brand today? One that you're subscribed to or mm. one that you love watching? I think Oats Overnight is a popular one. Oats Overnight right. is super popular. Yeah, it's office. a very, yeah. Everybody Everyone loves is, it in our office. Eating Oats Overnight. <laughs> um, what am I actually subscribed to? I think I don't subscribe to much. My uh, my filters in my house, yeah. like the air filters, that's water that's filters. Smart. Yeah, those that are the, those, those, those really are really smart. Easy. I'm always like <laughs> six months behind. Yeah, <laughs> so. exactly. Well, I think I think the winning subscriptions are the subscriptions you forget about. So yeah. you might mm -hmm. think like, okay, some of the SaaS stuff. Uh, a lot of SaaS stuff, it's annoying that you're subscribed to. Like, why do I have to pay for Microsoft Office every month now? <laughs> so then it's, what is the SaaS that I don't even notice, that I don't even mind? It's something like Amazon Prime. Yeah. I think very few people turn from Amazon Prime, so that's a great product. But then taking a step back, like, I still think of Amazon Prime as a subscription. I don't think of my internet or my water or something like that as a subscription. And I think that should be the Almost model for like all of us. necessities, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 And if you can make your product that much of a necessity and make the great subscription point. that, you know, simple, yeah. I think that is the goal for all of us. I love that. Well, that's a great closing line. One thing we love to do um, in all of our Tomorrow Brand episodes is if you guys can give, each of you can give one piece of advice for a brand that's looking to become a Tomorrow Brand and, and a brand that's going to be sustainable with some level of, of foundation around subscription and, and, and curating uh, customers that stick around. What's the one piece of advice you have for a brand founder or operator out there? And we can start with you, Dan. You need to have a winning product, right? It makes my job very easy when our product <laughs> is this good and it's the best in the market. Like you're That's not awesome. going to be able to scale a brand if you don't have the product that everyone loves. Yeah. So yeah, figure out the product that people like and it'll, it'll be very easy. Love that. Talk to your customers and that's exactly what Daniel yeah. meant, you know, reading tickets. It doesn't mean you have to call up your customers. We used to do that. We used to, everybody on the team actually yeah. would call customers that, you know, we'd email and say, do you mind having a phone call with us? We'd have physical calls with them and learn from them. But it is as simple as going in, being really close with your customer service team and making sure that they're passing up insights. And then you yourself going in there, hearing what the customer is saying, reading the reviews, that's how you get to a product that everybody loves. Yeah. And that's how you get to a winning brand. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you guys for an incredible episode. And I, and I uh, don't say this lightly. Um, I've had uh, my share of 100 plus episodes I've recorded, but there's not too many where I can say that's shared a lot of insights, um, a lot of great just banter on how to think about things with different perspectives. So I'm super excited because we have a lot of young viewers and we also have viewers of brands that have eight and nine figures that learn a lot from this. So thank you for taking time out of your busy day to, to make this happen. Thank you for having us. Thanks for having us. It was a blast.